Woodshop for a Valentine's Subway tradition? You've probably noticed more and more brands like Subway here showing up in your favorite movies and TV shows. Most streaming companies brag about being ad free, but what exactly is an ad? Product placement is exploding on their platforms, and advertisers call it a new frontier. Is it ringing? We don't know what Coors paid to get its beers on Amazon's homecoming, but we know it now spends 70% of its product placement budget to get on not network TV, but on streaming platforms. There's been a long debate here about booze ads in particular. In Canada, the CRTC forbids any kind of advertising that promotes young people drinking. And there's a reason. Just this week, another study, this one from NYU, found exposure to alcohol on TV is leading teens to drink more, just like we know the old smoking ads led to more teen smokers. But those rules don't apply to platforms like Netflix or Amazon Prime, even though millions of Canadians are watching. And now, everywhere you turn, it seems the characters on these shows are all drinking and smoking. You damn if you do, you damn if you don't. I went down to the club and I, I, mean, I can't. Put... An anti-tobacco nonprofit called Truth Initiative found that shows on streaming services like Netflix are the worst offenders, with two and a half times more smoking scenes than cable shows in 2016-17. For example, it found Stranger Things, which has a large young audience on Netflix, showed more than 260 cigarettes in its second season alone. Netflix responded to us saying, we recognize that smoking is harmful, and when portrayed positively on screen can adversely influence young people. They also told us that last year they decided all new projects with ratings of PG-13 or below will be smoking and e-cigarette free, except for reasons of historical or factual accuracy. We've posted their entire statement on our website. But, of course, it's not just Netflix. Take the Amazon hit Fleabag. Lots of smoking and drinking there, too. We reached out to Amazon, but we didn't get a response in time for this show. But all of this has got us wondering, how exactly did this come about? So here's what we do know. Many traditional advertising rules, they just don't apply to streaming companies. Alcohol companies can pay for product placement directly. There are no limits there. Cigarette companies technically can't. But we spoke to the authors of that tobacco report by NYU, or by the Truth Initiative, and they said tobacco companies have a long history of finding new ways to push their products, exploiting movies and TV, and they worry they've now moved on to streaming. To be clear, we have no evidence that tobacco companies have anything to do with all the smoking that you're seeing on screen. And for its part, Netflix says they're not paid by any companies to place any products. So what's this? Is that a PS Vita? Uh, which games does he have? So this might look like Sony paid to have their PlayStation Vita on House of Cards, but Netflix says no, they don't do paid product placements. Joining me from New York is Ashley Rodriguez. She's a journalist who's been writing about these streaming companies for Business Insider. So, Ashley, Netflix says it's not paid to place any products, but we see brand names everywhere. What's going on here? Yes, great question, Wendy. Um, there are a few ways that these relationships typically work. A lot of the product placement that you'll see in a show on Netflix is actually usually handled by the production itself. Um, and keep in mind, there are lots of ways to think about a Netflix original. Some of them are actually produced by Netflix itself, and some of them are just acquired by the company or a co-production. So that's why a lot of these arrangements tend to happen um, at the actual production level. In Canada, there's so long been so many restrictions on alcohol advertising, on tobacco advertising, and now we're seeing, it seems like every show you turn on, on all of these streaming platforms, everybody's smoking, everybody's drinking. So we're trying to figure out, like, do the, like, say the tobacco companies, do they have, do they have any influence? Are, is there any money switching hands that makes it seem like everybody is smoking and makes it cool to kids? We haven't been able to figure it out. I mean, is that because of all of these sort of partnerships and middlemen and it's just too complicated? 
It is. There are a lot of people that are, a lot of players, I should say, that are involved in arranging these relationships. I can't speak to the tobacco industry in particular and whether or not that money is changing hands. I do know that typically in the alcohol industry, for example, if a beer brand appears in a TV show, typically they are just offering the product and they are not paying to be in, to, in the show itself. And I think part of that is because of the regulation and the stigma that is around some of these big brands, right? The, these alcohol and tobacco categories, as you mentioned. And so it's, it's a bit easier if you don't actually exchange dollars, right? It makes that relationship a bit simpler and easier for you to go to market with. And yet we've seen so many shows where there are young people drinking and smoking their brains out. And in those cases, you'll probably notice that the logo is obscured or it's a fake brand um, that's being shown, right? They, they came up with some fake company that they, they make the beer bottles because it, it's really hard to get real brands that will allow themselves to be shown in that sort of image. But I just wonder, I mean, it still would help the tobacco companies because you're seeing, you know, people that you think are cool on these cool TV shows smoking or drinking. And yet we can't find any actual, you know, here's the contract where the tobacco company paid to have their brand on, because it's not a brand, it's just a cigarette. But just seeing people smoke makes smoking cool, you could argue. Sure, it's definitely, it's part of the culture and it gets to, to be part of the conversation. If, um, but that's sort of always been the case on TV, right? I don't think, um, it, you know, br traditional broadcast television is regulated a lot more heavily than these streaming services are. So there's a lot more control over, you know, how much airtime can people actually be smoking, cursing, doing these various things. Um, those same rules usually, um, every market is different, but those same rules usually don't apply in the same way to streaming companies. Wow. Yeah, I know the advertisers seem very excited about it. A lot of them have gone from advertising traditional on traditional television to advertising or product placement, they say, on, uh, on streaming companies. It's, it's, it's quite the move. They want to be part of these um, big cultural moments, um, but these are moments that a traditional advertising cannot reach. And so they have to get a little bit more creative in how they actually insert themselves into that. Some of them will try to capitalize on it on social media, um, but there's no better way than right having someone's favorite character actually holding the brand, um, and that'll get people a lot more enticed. Ashley Rodriguez, it's been great to talk to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ashley Rodriguez in New York. In just a few seconds, I'm going to talk to the man who co-founded Netflix. He left 15 years ago, just before the streaming giant became a streaming giant. Back then, the company was expanding, but not making money. And now, of course, it has almost 170 million subscribers worldwide. But get this, it's still losing money and only charges $14 a month. Joining us now from Silicon Valley is Mark Randolph. He has just published his best-selling memoir, That Will Never Work. Um, so, Mark, you're the pioneer in this business. Did you ever think when you started uh, Netflix back so many years ago that it would turn into the behemoth that it's become? No, it's the furthest thing from your mind. I mean, when you start a company, you're thinking about, can I actually get any customers to come in? You're never imagining you're going to have customers numbering in the hundreds, millions, that you're going to be all over the world, that you're going to make your own movies, that you're going to become a verb. I mean, I did not see that coming. So much has changed since you were there. It's got so many subscribers now, but it's still losing money. Other streaming services, they're making money, selling product placement. People seem to like that better than watching traditional ads. And the ad revenue at the streaming service, it, it's way up. I mean, it's not just that people didn't want to watch advertising in its standard form, but it really interfered with the storytelling. Back then, you had to have a 30-minute episode. You had to break it up into six- and seven-minute chunks to fit the ads in. You had to end it with a cliffhanger so people stayed to the next week. You had to start it with a, where you were last week. It was an unnatural form of storytelling. So regardless of the impact it has on how advertising um, adjusts, it's a much, much better way to tell stories. And I think that's something that all of us as consumers can enjoy. Reading a lot from people who write about data brokers and who write about the, the changes in media and about advertising, 
they're saying that streaming, not necessarily Netflix, but all of these companies, that, that, that streaming is, it's almost like the product placement on streaming is like, it's the next frontier in advertising that people don't want to watch ads anymore, so you put a product up on the screen during a show, and that's how you get through to people, and that brands have figured this out. Like, I'm just wondering, is it getting out of hand? Do you have any concerns about it? So I certainly don't. I mean, uh, part of that's part of the contract that if you do something for free, you need to support that with advertising or something else. But of course, the areas that I'm familiar with, you know, the Netflix services, which are paid subscription services, aren't dependent on advertising as a revenue stream. So I quite frankly don't see it, at least in that medium, as being a problem. Um, and I'm not fluent with what's happening on the other, other services about how they're uh, managing that conflict or not. I'm sure you watch Netflix shows. Don't you wonder what, what's with all this product placement? We say that my old company says they're not selling any, but there's all these products, all these brands everywhere. I don't notice it. I mean, I, and it's not that it's, I'm not watching it with a critical media eye. Um, I watch it because I enjoy watching Peaky Blinders or I enjoy watching BoJack Horseman. I'm not analyzing it. I, quite frankly, I, if you said their placement, I wouldn't know uh, what was being placed or where. But you, you, see, you see a lot of smoking, a lot of drinking, you see fancy cars and watches, and product placement is a big deal. And this is the machine that you created. I'm just wondering, does it concern you at all? Uh, I don't know enough about it to be concerned about what the dangers should be of that. I mean, I'm being quite honest with you. I, I, I look back at, say, these things that have been created, and I love the fact that we have all this data. I love the fact we know what people are watching and why they're watching. And I imagine that's going to be used in all kinds of ways. And primarily, it's being used to deliver things that people want to see. Mark Randall, thank you so much for, for talking to me. Thank you. A pleasure being with you.